Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. We want to encourage everybody to use the chat box. So please do keep typing away. And um, we want to really build up that nice and emit little environment in the chat box. So feel free to ask as many questions and share your experiences and so on. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm from the Civil Service College. You've probably seen me on uh, webinars in the past. And I am joined by our um, expert facilitator and trainer, Dylan Shimon, who will be delivering today's webinar on, on embracing imperfect leadership. Um, the webinar should last around one hour. And again, I just want to reiterate that we really want to hear from you. So if Dylan has any questions, if you want to share your experiences in the chat box, that is what it's there for. We want maximum partic participation and engagement from, from you all. So please do share, share your thoughts and comments. Um, just some housekeeping rules. Um, we have um, set the settings so that you can't use your microphones and your cameras. It's just to kind of save the connectivity and avoid any tech issues. Um, but again, the chat box is there for you to kind of communicate to us. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared in due course with you once it's been edited. So you can share that with your colleagues and um, friends and so on. That's absolutely fine. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to you, Dylan. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrea. And as Andrea just said, please use the chat function. Forgive me if I miss a comment or a question. Andrea is going to keep me in check on that. But um, yes, thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us here this morning um, on a session in which we would like to explore imperfect leadership and how in becoming culturally intelligent, we're better able to, to lead inclusively. So, my name is Dylan. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, she, her, and I self-identify as a South African white gender fluid gay man who is also an immigrant living in not so sunny London. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. But I've also been privileged enough to have gone to university, received an education, and also to have English as my mother tongue. I am the learning experience designer and lead CQ certified facilitator at Equality Leaders. So as the Civil Service College's EDNI partner, Equality Leaders essentially exists to accelerate learning journeys, craft spaces like today for us to have bold, inclusive conversations. And we also enjoy speaking with leaders and organizations, equipping them with the tools and resources that they need to innovate equitable outcome. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about what uh, we do at Equality Leaders and the Civil Service College. Welcome everybody. Before we jump into the um, session, we do have a very quick quiz. So it's just four questions. Andrea is going to pop in the chat the link to the quiz. So for those of you who can on your mobiles, laptops, tablets, whatever it is you are dialing in from, just click on that link. It'll take you to the four questions. It shouldn't take you longer than 15 seconds. Um, and I would be very curious to, um, yeah, collect your, your responses to these questions just so that we can kind of open up this uh, conversation to um, cultural intelligence. So thank you so much, um, Andrea, for <clears throat> popping that link in. Hopefully it's working for everybody. We did check it before we <laughs> dived in and Andrea is going to be able to share the results so can you Hello? see that that should work brilliant yes and if we go to the responses there we go okay. oh yeah brilliant there we go fantastic thank you so having international experience means i have high cq 66.7 percent of you said no okay does having technical competence lead to success? 71% of you said no. I have high EQ, so I must have high CQ, right? Gosh, 94% of you said no. And the fourth and final question, 
team diversity leads to innovation. 91.4% of you said yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, your responses. Um, and um, Andrea, thank you for, for getting that up for us all to see. Um, while I start chatting to that first question or statement, um, if I could ask you, Andrea, just to bring up the slides again. Mm -hmm. yep. So thank you so much, everybody, for um, taking part in that quiz. And I guess how I want to start the session off um, is to speak to each of these um, four statements and questions because they are assumptions that are commonplace and often made when we start talking about cultural intelligence, right? So that very first one, the assumption that if you have international experience, it must mean that you uh, could be described as culturally intelligent. But just because you perhaps have traveled widely across the, the world and been exposed to different cultures, ways of life, foods, languages, histories, etc. Perhaps you've had the opportunity to work in global organizations and global offices, right? It doesn't mean that you've necessarily developed that skill to work effectively or relate effectively with people across different cultures. The second point about technical competence being um, something that leads to success alone. Yes, it goes without saying technical skills are, of course, important, but our ability to influence, collaborate, manage our relationships with people, OK? Um, the ways in which we go about doing these will differ drastically from one cultural context to another. So it's not just the technical skills that we can rely on. Andrew, would you mind jumping to the next slide? Okay. Only because I see quiz, perfect, brilliant. And we're on to the third um, assumption, which is if you consider yourself to have high emotional intelligence, then surely this must translate into um, high CQ, cultural intelligence, right? And of course, you know, emotional intelligence, that ability to manage and regulate the emotions of self and others, it is, it's really important in becoming culturally intelligent. But if we stop and think for a while about those cues, right, that we rely on or that we depend on to read someone's emotional state, again, those look very different across different contexts. And I'll give you the perfect example here. So if you're anything like me, I am a complete emoji queen. It drives my family and my boss absolutely mad. Right. And here within our UK context, we use the rolling eyes emoji to express frustration or annoyance. OK. And yet that self same emoji in Japan, right, communicates something entirely different. And that is to say, when someone does use the rolling eye emoji, it's communicating to the other person saying, I'm going to need a little bit more thinking time to figure this out and I'll get back to you. So that just goes to show just how vastly different the same emoji, um, <clears throat> what that means in, in, in different uh, cultural contexts. And the very final point. So, Andrew, if you just click through exactly and again and again. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, is this um, myth? that diversity leads to innovation. So I'm really interested to see your responses. I think it was 94% of you said yes. And that's because it sounds reasonable enough, right? If you and your team or you and your organization are, are facing a particular challenge, well, it goes to figure that if you have a diversity of perspectives in the room, then 
it kind of makes sense that you would be able to come up with a very wide ranging selection of innovative solutions, right? Oh, Emma's just popped in the chat that they can still only see the first page of mm. the um, presentation, Andrea. I, uh, I can, I I can I, see the slides fine. Um, yeah. If Can anyone, yeah, everyone can see the correct slides. Um, Thanks, Belle. Could just, thank you for letting us know. Okay, perfect. Yep. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so where was I? Um, yes, so it makes perfect sense that if we have a diversity of perspectives in the room, right, we're going to be able to innovate far more solutions to that problem. And yet the research that's been conducted suggests otherwise, right? So diversity by itself doesn't lead to innovation. In fact, the research shows that homogenous teams tend to outperform diverse teams when cultural intelligence is missing. So my question um, to you, and I'd love to hear some of your responses in the chat, right, is why do you think that is? Why do you think that homogenous teams tend to outperform diverse teams when cultural intelligence is missing? I'm just gonna open up my chat here so we can see. If anyone's stuck on slide one, that's fine. Maybe just um, leave the link and rejoin because Microsoft Teams is a bit of a tinker and it, it does that. We are on st slide four, so um, yeah. And Elaine, yes, um, we can provide you um, with a link to the research uh, post webinar. I'm happy to share that with Andrea and the team. Um, brilliant. Lindsay or Alexander, uh, Better intra-team communications. Does anybody else have any uh, any other ideas? Um, great, Emma, it's working for you. Fantastic. So yeah, does anybody else want to um, perhaps offer a, a reflection as to why homogenous teams would tend to outperform diverse teams? Brilliant. Is it because cultural norms are understood across members? Yep. Perhaps homogenous groups innovate because their ideas can be built on and developed by other like minded people, more cohesive and hopefully open to discussion. Those are all valid points. Thank you, everybody. And that's exactly it. If you think about a homogenous team, a, a collection of individuals who have grown up in a very similar cultural context, they already have shared ways of communicating. They already have understood social interaction norms, and they probably speak the same language as, as native speakers, right? So they really don't need to put any work into managing that, as it were. They can pour themselves directly into the task or, or the challenge at hand. Whereas if you take a collection of individuals that come from vastly different uh, context, etc. Well, they've got to take one step back, don't they? They've really got to establish as a team shared meaning. They've got to better understand each other's cultural values. They've got to understand how they're going to make decisions and how they are going to communicate in an effective way. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. So suffice it to say at this point that diversity by itself does not lead to innovation. But when we combine that with cultural intelligence, it absolutely does. So Andrea, if I could ask you just to jump to the next slide. Perfect, and again, brilliant. This is the point that I want to land, that cultural intelligence here is the multiplying factor. Brilliant, so I guess the million dollar question then is what are we talking about when we speak about cultural intelligence or you're going to hear me refer the, to this as CQ a lot. Um, what do we mean? What are we talking about here? So Andrea, next slide please. So the definition for those of us who do like a definition, 
Oh, one back. Perfect. Thank you. Cultural intelligence is a person's capability to work, to function and relate effectively in culturally diverse situations. We take a very broad, all inclusive, as it were, definition to culture here. So I don't want you just to think that we're only talking about um, international borders, you know, living and working in different countries. Yes, that is a part of it. But in terms of culture and our understanding within this definition, we're also referring to people, communities, teams, organizations that are different to your own, different to those in which you inhabit. And it's rooted, as I've already said, in over two decades of rigorous academic research, right, which has been conducted across 168 countries and to date involved more than 200,000 participants which have informed this research. And what has emerged from this is four capabilities that exist among people who can be described as culturally intelligent. And these four capabilities include CQ drive, CQ knowledge, CQ strategy, and CQ action. And I'm going to spend the next couple of moments just walking you through each of these so you have a better idea as to, to what we're talking about here. Brilliant. So CQ drive essentially speaks to your motivation, right? It includes your intrinsic interests. So whether you genuinely derive enjoyment from culturally diverse encounters, conversations, proactively putting yourself into those situations, inviting difference into your um, every day. But it also looks at your extrinsic interests, right? So this is the degree to which you recognize concrete objective value in working with and relating to people different to yourself. And of course, confidence, right? Your confidence in being able to navigate these encounters is also a part of your CQ drive. When we look at CQ knowledge, this is about your level of knowledge when it comes to cultural values and how those show up in different parts of the world as it were, or even different cultural values between organizations or within your own organization. Each department, right, is a network, a community in and of itself. And some of them will have differing values, perhaps, or, or different ways of communicating. And this speaks to your knowledge of that. It also speaks to your knowledge of religious beliefs, right? It also speaks to the sociolinguistic elements. So this is not just your knowledge of other languages besides that of your native tongue, but also your knowledge of communication norms, different ways of writing. So here the perfect example is the date format, which still confuses me to this day, because here in the UK and most of Europe, we use the day followed by the month, right? However, in North America, our siblings over there switch that around. <laughs> and so it does, it causes a great deal of confusion. And it's just about having this knowledge and this awareness, right, that there are different ways in which we communicate. It also looks at our ability to follow insider jargon. All of our families, our friendship circles, our teams, we're all really good at having that jargon and using it, right? It can be incredibly overwhelming for an outsider or someone who's not part of that group to follow that. So again, it's about that awareness. And finally, leadership plays a really important part here in CQ knowledge. So that is looking at one's knowledge of 
managing people and our relationships with them across different cultures. CQ strategy, <clears throat> I think if I if I could choose a favorite of these four capabilities, it's probably this one because it involves planning. So this is when you take the time before the conversation encounter <clears throat> or moving into a different context to think through what may actually unfold during this encounter, right? How it may be really different to your typical interactions with people who you know and work uh, closely with, right? It also takes a look at what happens during the conversation or the encounter, right? So it's about sensing those perspectives, your own and those of others. And the final piece is the checking piece. So this is taking the time post encounter, after the conversation, whatever it is, where you take the time to self examine any assumptions you may have had, any potential biases that could have impacted your decision making or the way in which you navigated that space. But it also speaks to adjusting our mind maps where experience has differed to our expectations. So there's three layers there when it comes to this um, capability of CQ strategy. And the fourth capability is CQ action. And I guess that kind of, you know, the name in and of itself speaks to what we're, we're discussing here. And that is our ability to, <clears throat> excuse me, modify our behaviors to adapt or fit to a specific uh, context, right? So perhaps we need to modify, adapt or adjust the manner and content of our communication. So perhaps in your everyday within your team, your comfort zone is to communicate in a very direct way or in in an expressive way, like me, I am very expressive. I, I tend to be very direct, right? It's not to say that in another context or a conversation that, that you need to plan for or will be having, that those are going to be effective ways of communicating, right? You may need to be a little bit more indirect, less expressive, and it's about navigating, flexing those uh, capabilities. And of course, as many of us know here, communication is both about the verbal and the nonverbal. So when it comes to our verbal ways of communicating, it is the vocabulary that we use. It's our tone, it's our accents, right? Uh, both Andrea and I have accents from where we're from, right? And we probably, depending on our situations, we adapt that accordingly just so that we can communicate in more effective ways. There's also that nonverbal piece, right? Our facial expressions, our body language, our gestures. These are all critical to communicating effectively and require us, if we want to work and relate effectively across different contexts, to be able, we, we need to be able to adapt those. So that, everybody, is the CQ model in a nutshell. Of course, I've just touched the surface, but it gives you a good understanding as to what we're discussing here. And I think it's important to note here that the four capabilities are not static. They can be developed. So we can actively choose to commit to developing each of these. Perhaps you're incredibly, um, you, your strength lies in your CQ knowledge. You know a lot. You have a, a, a deep understanding about how cultures are similar and different because of your experience, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that your ability to, to plan, right, and to adjust your mental maps and, and speak to that strategy piece 
is a strength of yours. So these capabilities will shift in time and you can develop them. And I think, you know, at this point, it's important to say that underpinning this entire CQ model is about growing that self-awareness, acknowledging we are all imperfect leaders, recognizing where our strengths lie, but also acknowledging those areas where we can commit to taking action to do better. And an essential part to this self-awareness piece is having a deeper understanding of cultural value diversity. Understanding the different values at play allow us to lead more inclusively. So what do I mean when I talk about cultural value diversity? Andrew, if you could switch to the next slide for me, that would be great. Thank you. Brilliant. So again, for those of you who love a definition, as do I, our cultural values are what we consider important, desirable, right? They are an expression of our preferred ways of living and working. And I've lost track of how many decades of research by social scientists, sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, you name it, have been spent mapping out these cultural values. And again, what has emerged from this research is essentially 10 value dimensions, cultural value dimensions. I've only listed five here because unfortunately time doesn't allow us to speak to all 10, but I'm just going to briefly speak to these five that I've got up here on the screen. Again, just to give you um, a general idea of, of what we're, we're discussing here. So think of each of these dimensions almost as spectrums. So you have individualism on the one end and collectivism on the other. Each of us, will be able to plot ourselves somewhere along that spectrum, somewhere along that continuum. Neither is right or wrong. This is not an evaluative exercise. We all accept we have preferred ways of living and working. We all acknowledge that different things are important to different people and that's okay right but having this awareness of these dimensions really does allow us right to lead more inclusively <clears throat> so if you tend to sit closer to the individualistic side it means you value individual goals, individual rights. That's what's important to you. If, however, you lean more towards the collectivist side, it is personal relationships. It's the group goals that matter to you more than the individual rights. When we look at low power distance and high power distance, some of us are quite happy. We thrive in organizations where structures tend to be more hierarchical, more of a top-down leadership approach. That's a high power distance organization. For some, it's the low power distance context in which they thrive and work best, right? That's where there is shared decision-making. Structures are far more egalitarian. <clears throat> The low and high uncertainty avoidance. Um, this is a favorite of mine because I couldn't be further <laughs> to the high uncertainty avoidance spectrum. I think I'm off the chart actually with this. I love predictability, planning, contingency planning. I will plan on my plans because I don't like uncertainty. However, if you take my brother, for example, who has sold up his house and booked a one-way ticket to Bali, Indonesia for a year to go and teach English, 
he's quite okay to go with the flow, flexible, adaptable. Yeah, let's just see, you know, what comes my way and I'll kind of just, you know, deal with it when it comes. Those people are comfortable, right, with low uncertainty avoidance. When we look at the cooperative and the competitive dimension, some of us are driven and like to emphasize the competition, the assertiveness, the achievement, right? Where some of us may be more focused on collaboration, nurturing those relationships that we have with people which make us more cooperative. And finally, the fifth dimension, and like I said, there are another five, but we don't have time for those, is our time orientation. So there's the short term orientation. People want those quick wins and they want them now. They want success now. Others may delay that success, may delay that satisfaction, right? Because it's more about that long term planning. And interestingly here, within our Western European, UK, North American context, we find companies will have a two, probably a five year strategy plan, right, for their business and for their people, which to us seems relatively long term. But when you compare that <clears throat> to, again, I use the um, Japanese context or the Korean context, companies there have 10, 15, 20 year strategies, right? To them, from their vantage point, our two five year plans is incredibly short term and short sighted, right? So it's really, really interesting, um, these, the, these different dimensions and, and understanding where we sit on each of these. Thank you, Andrew. If we could switch to the next slide. Brilliant. So what do these cultural values tell us? They tell us that rather they inform us of our general orientation, right, to our life and our relationships. They can expose potential biases that we may have towards others, right, with different cultural values. And I think this is the key point to land here, that it doesn't, again, predict your ability to work effectively. So again, when we have an awareness of our preferences, it gives us the ability to flex when needed, right? Brilliant. Thank you. Next slide, please, Andrea. So taking all of this that we've just spent the last um, 20 minutes going through, I'd like to just briefly describe to you how this can be applied, how the CQ model and our understanding of these cultural value dimensions can be applied within an organizational context. And I'll speak to the growing one's inclusive leadership capabilities. So if you look at CQ Drive, this is your motivation to address whatever leadership challenge it is that you are facing. You've then got your CQ knowledge. This is understanding the different values at play, okay, that are impacting the, the dynamics of the challenge. When you look at CQ strategy, that is you coming up with a plan for addressing whatever challenge it is you're facing inclusively. And of course, there's the CQ action piece, and that is adapting flexing your leadership to meet the needs of your people and your team to draw on their diversity. We could also apply the framework, the CQ model, to your DE&I um, initiatives, right? It acts as a strategic enabler, right? So again, if we look at CQ Drive, that's knowing your why, understanding your purpose. Why are you committing to the DE&I work? Why are you committed to engaging with that space? Is it because you recognize there are shifting expectations of both your people 
and the communities that you serve? Or is it because you recognize the functional case of DEI? And that is to say, you know, you understand that when your people can show up as their whole selves in the workplace or workspaces, when they have access to career opportunities, development, mentoring, coaching, whatever the case is, they thrive and therefore your organization thrives. Okay. When we take a look at the CQ knowledge, piece. This is the data that you have, right? Your people data that you can use to make evidence based people decisions. OK, it speaks to that storytelling piece, which many of us will know is critical to the DE and I space. Storytelling invites that empathy, that compassion in to the conversation and together with the data it can inform your policies and your practices which you will have to review and you will have to um, create new policies and practices new ways of working to ensure there are equitable outcomes for your people when we look at the cq strategy piece to this de and i needs to be tackled like you would any other business challenge, right? It has to be led from the top. Leadership needs to be role modeling the behaviors expected, and it has to be led with an unrelenting focus. The final piece, the CQ action, it, again, it goes without saying, right? This is operationalizing your um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, forgive me. Thank you so much for asking that question. Whoever it was in chat, what do I mean by D, E and I? Apologies. I made that assumption. When I speak of D, E and I, I'm talking about diversity, equity and inclusion. Some people mix those around. I think it's the civil service college yeah. that use e equality, diversity and inclusion, E, D and I. It depends. Um, but yes, yeah, sorry. So yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking to here. So it's about implementing right that change strategy. It's about evaluating, measuring those tangible outcomes and reporting your progress or lack thereof in transparent ways. Right. So that just gives you a very high level overview of how we can take this model and apply it to help grow an inclusive leadership practice, build high performing teams and help you put together that strategy for your EDI and i um, endeavors. Could we go to the next slide? So if I haven't already said it or landed this point, I will say it again. The research shows that when you integrate cultural intelligence with your business strategies, your people's strategies, right? It results in enhanced performance outcomes, right? The results are there to see. If you could switch to the next slide, Andrea, thank you. And it impacts on knowledge sharing and innovation, leadership effectiveness, trust and psychological safety, inclusion and belonging. If I haven't said that already, forgive me. I think I'm repeating myself here. Yeah. <laughs> but those are the very real concrete impact that integrating cultural intelligence into your everyday um, leadership practice and organization, right, has. So before I hand you back over to Andrea, who will walk you through what is on offer with um, our course that we are running in September, I do want to leave you with a short video, which yes, it is comical, <laughs> but it in a very masterful way highlights the importance, right, of all of us committing to becoming more culturally intelligent. So thank you so much, everybody. I am going to leave you with this video. OK, and fingers crossed everyone can hear it. It worked last time, so I'm going to press play now.
<laughs> Thank you, Andrea. So yes, no matter how many times I watch that video, it still makes me laugh. So thank you so much. I, I know some of you weren't able to to watch the video, but I think as Andrea said um, previously, it is um, Teams yeah. that plays up. So you may need to, um, we can share the- We'll the share the video, yeah. It's only, I think it's only what, three minutes long. It's really, it's actually really funny, um, but leaves a really good impression on what Dylan has actually discussed. And we will share that um, straight away. In fact, Dylan, if you can get the um, YouTube link now and put it in the chat box for those that haven't oh, yeah, been able sure. to. Um, in the meantime, what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to move on to the next slide while Dylan um, retrieves that link. And please do watch it because it is fantastic and it um, it, it might, yeah, make you giggle. Um, obviously, this, um, this webinar is on the back of a full day course that Dylan does deliver um, with the Civil Service College. Um, the next open course that we have takes place on the 27th of September um, this year and it's a full day course. If you are interested in finding out more information on this, uh, please do email me at andrea at civilservicecollege.org.uk. It is a face-to-face -face open course. We are based in London. However, we do offer in-house bespoke versions of this course where um, myself and Dylan will meet with you and your organisation to discuss a format that works better for you. So if you'd prefer this to be in a different format, um, if you want to have a more in-depth discussion about your requirements and needs for training around the cultural intelligence course that Dylan delivers, um, please do get in touch with me. Uh, we can offer a tailored version of this for your organisation. But again, if you'd like to attend the open course dates, please feel free um, to email me and find out more about the 27th of September. Um, Dylan has just posted the video in the chat box. Please do watch it for those that didn't manage to. Um, and sorry you didn't access that at the same time as us. Um, I'm just going to go to this slide here for you, Dylan, if you just want to. Yeah, so thanks, Andrea. I just wanted to add on to what Andrea's already shared with you, everybody. A core part of the workshop, of the program, is that self-awareness piece. So before um, the workshop, you will be given access to um, an assessment feedback report. So it doesn't take very long. Think of it as one of those, um, oh gosh, what do you call it? Those, um, is it psychoanalytic assessments that so many of us have done, right? It's something similar to that, but it essentially maps out where you are in terms of each of those four capabilities. So it gives you that insight. It gives you that self-awareness where your strengths lie, where you can um, perhaps do better. It also gives you a personal development plan. And Andrew, if I could just, oh, psychometric assessments. <laughs> Thank you. That's the word. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. So part of that, or at least what's included in that assessment report that each of you will receive when signing up for that course is your CQ profile. It'll compare your scorings with worldwide norms. It gives you that development plan, as I've already said, but it also will plot you along each of those 10 um, cultural value dimensions, of which I only spoke to five, but you will have a very, very good idea of where you sit. And it's important because what we do is we take your reports and we integrate that throughout the day in activities, etc. So you will walk away with a deep dive into what CQ is, how our cultural values impact our ability to collaborate and innovate, and you will have this um, personalized feedback report with your own um, development plan in place. So I think we have about 10 minutes left, don't we, Andrea? For we do. Um, so usually, I mean, you, you know what it's like at the end of a, a session, a typical Q&A. Um, but I, I don't know if anyone does have any questions for Dylan or wants to share their experiences or if, if it's a matter of kind of going away and absorbing all of the information and then coming back 
to Dylan and myself for questions. That's absolutely fine. Um, Dylan, same goes for you. If you've got any questions for the audience or if you're quite inquisitive to know what their stories are, you might want to ask them now as well. It's really up to you. And um, what I am going to put in the chat box, if anyone does have questions, please do pop your questions in there. Um, alternatively, I am going to put my email address back in there. So if you do have any questions later on down the line, please feel free um, to email me. And I'm sure Dylan, you'd be quite happy to answer those questions at a later stage. And um, again, whilst people are thinking of any questions, no matter if they're quite basic in general, that's fine or quite in depth, feel free to use the chat box. If not, again, get in touch. But whilst you are just waiting, I'm just going to leave it on that slide just for now. Um, just to remind you of the session that is taking place in September time. Um, for my behalf, I just want to say thank you, Dylan. It's been such a pleasure working with you on this, and I know that you've delivered a bite-sized session to my colleagues before at the college. Um, and yeah, it, it went down brilliantly. It, it was such an insightful, fantastic session, and I know that Dylan um, would definitely, you know, give the same experience to you all as well um, for your organisation or whether it's an open course. Um, Dylan, I can see there's some comments coming through on the chat box. Yeah, I'm looking through those, Andrea, and thank you. Thank you for having me and hosting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. One of the questions is asking whether I could explain a little bit more why homogenous teams might be more innovative, just to confirm understanding. And yeah, absolutely, because this is something that um, throws a lot of people off, especially now, right? We hear a lot about, oh, diversity leads to innovation. The point here was that when you have a group of people, right, who have grown up in a very similar cultural context. They've gone to similar schools, their parents have similar jobs, they're of a similar, um, you know, uh, cultural group. We're kind of just born into that, right? We're taught from a very young age, three, four years old, right? We're conditioned into acceptable ways of behavior, acceptable ways of interacting with people. So when you bring those self same people together into a team they don't have to manage any of that right it's just accepted they are able to just um, have those shared ways of meaning and of communicating and so they can pour all their energy into the problem at hand right when you have a team that has a number of individuals from vastly different contexts, vastly different linguistic backgrounds, socioeconomic, religious, you know, all those dimensions of diversity. It means each of those individuals have vastly different ways in which they've had to navigate that world. What may be acceptable and an established way of communicating in my context may look very, very different to that of yours, for example. And therefore, it requires a culturally intelligent leader or a culturally intelligent person, right, to again, adjust, adapt, have that awareness, have that understanding that, oh, you know, in my family or in my team or within, you know, my South African context, this is the way we communicate. We communicate very directly. We'll tell you how it is. When I came to the UK, for example, that was very, very different. I was often considered to be rude, standoffish, a little too direct. And over the years, I've had to adapt to that, right? So that I am able to communicate effectively and I can relate to people. So that is the, the link between homogenous teams tending, right? It's not a it's not a it's not a guarantee. It's not always the case, but the research shows that there is a tendency for them to outperform diverse teams when cultural intelligence is missing.
So right. I hope that um, clarifies that question. Were there any more, Andrea? And um, there was a question for. Well, I can see that someone. Um, I think it's Despina. I think that's that's your name. Had put a hand up. If you've got a question, if if you don't mind putting it in the chat box, that would be great. Um, just because obviously team members don't. Um, audience members don't have access to microphones. And um, there's a couple of question and um, comments that have come through. Ken, I've received your um comment about the course and about your team so you've probably seen that in there Dylan um yeah. by Ken Ken in there um yes please get in touch with me to discuss that's fine we can arrange a um a call with with Dylan to meet with you and people within your organization to discuss potential opportunities to support um I don't know if you can say any other questions in there no just to Ken's point and this is about um the the practical application right of cq in a distributed working environment so um ken if i may just touch briefly and perhaps this answers your question many of our clients are global organizations with offices on every continent right and this is exactly why they've come to us and asked us for the cq because every day you are bringing, or these organizations are bringing people in virtually, right, from that distribute, from a distributed working environment, to use your word, and they're expected, right, to deliver the results. And this is a fertile environment, for the want of uh, better words, for CQ and its application and its significance in making that work right so it had like that's the perfect application of um of cq and we will take a deep dive in the full day course right into all of this um because it is very much at that global level it can be um applied um kamala thank you dylan oh the message has moved thank you dylan sometimes um sometimes the majority slash minority dynamics can also affect confidence of team players hence outcomes mm. though everyone on the planet is hurtling towards the future not everyone is with like-minded companies or aspirations absolutely uh despina thank you i've really enjoyed this webinar thank you very much and yeah just some really lovely comments in there dylan um I just yet yeah, again want to say thank you to everyone that has joined us and um, thank you for your time this recording will be sent to you all and um, if you do again have any questions and you want to get back to us with any of your comments please feel free to get in touch with me and a massive massive thank you to Dylan of course for delivering uh, today's webinar it's been a joy to have you here and it's been lovely to work with you and we hope to see you on one of our webinars again in the future but if not we'll see you in, in September of course to deliver the session so thank you thank you so much everybody take care of yourselves bye bye thank you bye everyone thanks